Hi, I'm Peter Adamson. Welcome back to Women Thinkers in Antiquity and the Middle Ages, brought to you by King's College London and the LMU in Munich. Today is going to be the third lecture. We're going to be looking at women in later ancient philosophy and especially in late antiquity. So let me say a little bit about what that means. Late antiquity is a phrase that scholars nowadays use to refer especially to the ancient world pretty far into the, um, the history, so like after the fall of the Roman Republic, perhaps. And I'm mostly going to be talking about figures from that period. I will also at the beginning be touching on figures from the Hellenistic period. And it might help a little bit, therefore, if I say just at the outset, the difference between classical antiquity, the Hellenistic period, and late antiquity, especially with reference to the history of philosophy, since that's mostly what we're talking about. So in the history of philosophy, classical, classical antiquity basically has the pre-Socratic period, so all the thinkers up to Socrates, then Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And that's basically what we've covered so far. So we looked at some thinkers who were at least supposedly Pythagoreans, and then we looked at the views of Plato and Aristotle. And we saw that Plato, broadly speaking, is what you might call a feminist or relatively feminist thinker. At least he thinks that women can and should do philosophy. Aristotle adheres much more closely to the general cultural expectations of women in his time. And he seems to think that women wouldn't be philosophers. And in fact, if you look at history, this is pretty much how play, things play out. So there are not women philosophers in the Aristotelian tradition. There are in the, in the Platonic tradition. However, before we get to that story, we have to go through the Hellenistic period. So the Hellenistic period often is said to be the time between the conquest of Alexander the Great and somewhere in the first century BC, perhaps, or even the first century AD. It sort of depends who you ask, but you could maybe say the death of Cleopatra would be a nice kind of marker um, and the rise of Augustus Caesar. So the transition from, uh, from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. We won't get too hung up on that. The main difference we're interested in is what's going on in the history of philosophy in this period. So in the Hellenistic period, so roughly speaking, now we're actually talking about more like from the fourth century BC, the time of Plato and Aristotle. So from there, all the way up to maybe the second or third century AD, we have the proliferation of several schools of philosophy. And these schools have names that will be known to you. So we have the Stoics, we have the Epicureans, we have the cynics, and we have the skeptics. Notice that actually all of those words still exist in English, so you can be stoic about a problem you're facing, you can be an Epicurean about your eating habits, you can be cynical about prospects of success or about politics, and you can be skeptical about just about anything. Now, an interesting question here is to what extent did women play a role in these schools? And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But first, let me say what we mean by late antiquity or by late antique philosophy. So again, you can kind of draw the mark, the barrier there, wherever you want, between the Hellenistic period and the late ancient period. But I would tend to draw it around about the third century AD, which is kind of late. And the reason is that that's when we get Plotinus. Plotinus is the founder of a new way of doing philosophy, which we now call Neoplatonism. He would not have called himself a Neoplatonist, he would have just called himself a Platonist. And basically, as the name implies, he's a follower of Plato, but he takes in a lot of ideas from other traditions, in particular from Stoicism and Aristotelianism. And this is a very successful form of philosophy, so much so that it effectively exterminates all the other schools, it swallows ideas from them, and everyone, as it were, is a Platonist from the third century on, with a few exceptions, among pagans. At around the same time, of course, you have the rise of Christianity in late antiquity. And for a while, you have pagan Platonist philosophy coexisting with Christian philosophy. And the two are in some ways rivals. Uh, so some pagan philosophers felt themselves very threatened by Christianity. Almost all Christian philosophers were very critical of pagan philosophers. Um, but Nonetheless, we should think of these as two strands of philosophy and not fall into the common trap of thinking that there's Christian theologians and pagan philosophers so that Plotinus, for example, would be a philosopher, but Augustine wouldn't. I would consider Augustine and numerous other uh, 
Christian thinkers to be philosophers, and there's only going to play a role in the story I'm going to tell in this lecture. So at this time, especially as Christianity really gets going, as the emperor um, as starting with Constantine, we have Christian emperors as well. Um, so you have political support for Christianity, and you have these two philosophical traditions going along side by side. But in many ways, and for our purposes, in, in pretty much all the relevant ways, it turns out that Christian and pagan philosophy in late antiquity are very similar. So they both draw on Platonism and they both draw on Stoicism. And as we're about to see, the Stoics also thought that women could be philosophers. So maybe it's not a surprise that you get a, a big change between classical antiquity, which we've been looking at so far, and late antiquity, already to some extent Hellenistic, um, the Hellenistic period. And the big change is that now we have very clearly identified, named women philosophers. This is something I already mentioned in the first lecture. This is exciting, and this is what we're going to talk about in this lecture. However, there is a major caveat to be, bear in mind, something else I mentioned in the first lecture, namely the women philosophers that we know about did not write works that have survived to us today. So some of the people we're going to be talking about, Hypatia, Macrina, Monica, these are the three people I'm going to be mostly talking about. Um, Hypatia is a famous pagan philosopher who was put to death by a Christian mob in Alexandria. Um, Macrina was the sister of a church father who wrote in Greek, so she's Christian. Hypatia is, like I said, pagan. Macrina is uh, Christian. And um, she's the, the sister of Gregory of Nyssa, and he wrote works about her, as we're going to see. Monica is the mother of Augustine, and he wrote works that mention her. And you'll notice that in all three cases, we don't have any texts actually written by them, at least not on philosophical topics. We do have some evidence of Hypatia's work in mathematics. So there's kind of good news and bad news here. The good news is we definitely have like really existing philosophers who are women. So we don't have the problem, for example, Diatima from Plato's Symposium, where we're not even sure whether she was real. If she was real, we're not sure whether what Plato says and puts in her mouth is anything she would have really said or the Pythagorean letters that we saw were written centuries after the supposed authors actually lived. We don't have that problem. We have a new problem, though, which is that in reading the works by these women, so to speak, we're actually just reading works by men. In fact, what we're reading is very positive reports by men of these women. So um, that's not obviously a reason to say we shouldn't take it seriously, and we're going to take it seriously in this lecture, but it is a reason to um, sort of realize that we still have to wait in order to read works that were actually written by women and survive today. Okay, so now let's go back to what I was just saying about the Hellenistic period where we have these schools, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the Cynics, and the Skeptics. Now, something you may notice is that I didn't mention Platonism and Aristotelianism there. So it's not like there are six schools contending for supremacy in the Hellenistic period. Rather, although the works of Plato and Aristotle were certainly known to some extent, there's actually some debate about how much extent, but although they were known, they weren't very influential. And you don't have a strong tradition of Platonism as we would understand it, or Aristotelianism in this period. They kind of make a comeback around the first, second century AD, until with Plotinus, uh, you have the rise of Neoplatonism and the ultimate victory of Platonism over the other schools. Before that, what we have is these other schools um, that in some ways react to Plato and Aristotle, but don't necessarily take them as the main philosophical figures. To the contrary, they have their own philosophical founders. So obviously the Epicureans look back to Epicurus. Uh, the Cynics look back to Diogenes the Cynic, famous philosopher about whom there's a lot of great stories. Um, so the most famous one is He's sunning himself on his wine jar where he lives. The king, Alexander the Great, comes and says, what can I do for you? And Diogenes says, you can stop blocking my light. So that's a famous story about Diogenes. There are some other good stories about him. Um, so he's the founder of cynicism, or usually taken to be the founder of cynicism. You have Pyro, the founder of skepticism. Um, and you have Zeno, the founder of Stoicism. And they, the schools sort of look back to them as founding figures who have a lot of authority. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning here is that skepticism in this period 
is largely unfolding in a way within the Platonic tradition because Plato's academy was taken over by skeptics. So although they're not, they're not Platonists in the sense we would realize, they see themselves as followers of the Socrates who was portrayed in the Platonic dialogues, who was always asking questions, never satisfied with the answers. That's what a skeptic is in, Hellenistic, in the Hellenistic period. Um, that's what's going to be so important for us because among the schools, the best evidence we have about women in the history of philosophy is actually found among Cynics and Stoics. So um, both of these uh, schools, especially at the beginning of Stoicism and throughout the entire history of Cynicism, they are considered by other people and by themselves to be in some ways sort of antisocial or at least very critical of society. You can especially see that with Diogenes the Cynic. So this idea that he lives in a wine jar that he insults the king or other stories about him that have him basically making fun of people, um, doing other things to sort of show he rejects society. One of my favorite examples of this is that he waited until a theater performance was letting out. And then as hundreds of people were leaving the theater, he went in. That's another story about Diogenes, which kind of shows that he thinks everyone else is thinking the wrong way. It's supposed to represent that. Um, now, I wouldn't say that the history of cynicism has a lot of women in it, but there's a very famous example. There's someone named Hipparchia, who was a cynic philosopher and who was married to another cynic philosopher who uh, was basically the object of her affections and tried to convince her that he was nothing for him by stripping naked and saying, this is all I have to offer you. And she said, I'll take it, basically. And so they got married and they lived as cynics. So they in the normal cynic style, they were homeless, they had sex in public, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, again, she's not someone for whom we have surviving works. Indeed, we don't have works by any of the early cynics, really. So there are no treatises by Diogenes, for example. There are just stories about him, like the stories I've just mentioned. But there are lots of anecdotes about the early cynics. And there's a great anecdote about Hipparchia that I would like to share with you. So here it is. I'll put the text up. So she's at a dinner party, probably, and she's talking to this guy named Theodorus, who is also a philosopher. And um, at the beginning of the story, as you can see here, it says that Theodorus is known as the atheist. And they are making fun of each other. And she puts him down, so insults him by means of the following sophism, in other words, uh, sort of dubious or tricky argument. She says, any action that would not be called wrong if done by Theodorus would not be called wrong if done by Hipparchia. Now, Theodorus does no wrong when he strikes himself. Therefore, neither does Hipparchia do wrong when she strikes him. And I guess we have to imagine him, her slapping him at this stage. He had no reply, but tried to strip her of her cloak. She showed no sign of alarm or panic like a woman. And when he said, is this she quitting woof and warp and comb and loom? That's a quote from a poem. She replied, it is I, Theodorus, but do you suppose I have given myself bad counsel if instead of wasting time upon the loom, I spent it on education? It's a really interesting story because it actually shows her rejecting the standard expectations of women in, antique, in antiquity. So if you think about you know, Aristotle's assumption that the woman would be at home taking care of the household, working on the loom, in other words, weaving, would be a, if not the kind of paradigmatic female activity. So the fact that she says, well, I don't do weaving, I spend all my time um, gaining education. She's the Greek word there is paideia. She's saying that she's um, rejecting the expectations of society, the expectations that society has of her as a woman so that she can live as a philosopher instead. And that goes very well with the whole cynic stance, which is to reject the values of society and focus on what really matters. What is it that really matters? Well, virtue and self-sufficiency. So the idea of living, for example, living in the rough um, or making do without wealth, these are ideas that the cynics support by saying that the more you can live without, the more self-sufficient you are. And you should also live in accordance with nature and not in accordance with the expectations of society. And that's how she's trying to live. Now, early on, especially in the history of Stoicism, there's a lot of overlap between Stoics, the Stoics and the Cynics. So especially Zeno of Kidion, who I mentioned before, he's the founder of Stoicism. 
in some ways, you could think of him as almost like a cynic philosopher. So he wrote a work um, called The Republic, actually, like Plato's Republic, in which he suggested the way that society should be arranged and makes all these kind of shocking suggestions, including suggestions that remind us of the um, way that women would be shared around and that children would be shared around in the Republic. So again, there's a maybe kind of proto-feminist uh, strand in Zeno. And there's another early Stoic who wrote a work called That the Virtue of Women is the Same as the Virtue of Men. Unfortunately, that work is lost, but the title kind of tells its own story. Later on in the Roman Stoic tradition, we have a philosopher named Musonius Rufus who argues for the same proposition. So this is a kind of continuous theme in Stoic philosophy, and it actually goes well with a general thesis of Stoic philosophy, which is that all humans are, at least in theory, perfectly rational. So we're rational through and through. When we do bad things, it's just because we have the wrong beliefs. It's not because we have desires that are unrational, which we can't control. It's always that our actions and our decisions are the outcome of things we believe about the world, so that if we could just get our reason right and have knowledge about the way things really are, we would always get everything right. That's the kind of um, central piece of the Stoic ethical philosophy. And they think this is true of all humans. So an interesting question, therefore, about the Stoics is what do they say about humans who are mistreated on the basis of their class or gender. So one thing that's attracted a lot of discussion through the years among scholars nowadays, I mean, is what the Stoics have to say about slavery. And there it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, here, the, probably the first thing that comes to mind here is that one of the most famous Stoics in history, Epictetus, who lived in the Roman period, was himself a slave. And so you, you'd sort of tend to assume this is paradigmatic of the Stoic attitude that even a slave can be a philosopher. And certainly that comes out in his own philosophy, partially in the sense, though, not that he wants to abolish slavery, as that he would, in a way, say that it doesn't matter if you're a slave, because no matter who you are, you can still be virtuous by having control over your own decisions. That would be, a, again, a kind of centerpiece, an example of that centerpiece um, Stoic idea that if you can just get your beliefs to be right, and to track virtue and the truth, then you'll be a good, happy person. And that's very much what Epictetus wants to say. Um, is this also true of women? Well, yes, that at least that's their official story. Uh, so hence, the virtue of a woman is the same as the virtue of a man. So what that means is that the, um, the women should be trying to get control over their reason and have the right kinds of beliefs, just as men should, just as even slaves should. Um, and women are capable of this. Maybe the only humans that aren't capable of this would be children because they're not ready to do it. Having said that, as I mentioned in passing, Epictetus doesn't argue that we should abolish slavery despite having been a slave. And in general, the Stoics don't argue for that. They sometimes argue that you should treat your slaves well, or for example, that you shouldn't disdain to have dinner with your slaves, but they don't try to lead a campaign to abolish slavery, which is really a shame because at one point, there was a Stoic who was the Roman emperor, namely Marcus Aurelius. And so if he had wanted to abolish slavery, he really could have done something about it, I would imagine. But this is never something the Stoics really um, argue for. And in a way, you can kind of see why they wouldn't, because they think that the situation you find yourself in in life is not really determinative of whether you're a good and happy person. What determines whether you're a good and happy person is how you respond to that and how you control your own will and your own beliefs and your own choices. So to quote Epictetus, he says, you can chain my leg, but you cannot chain my will. So even if you were a prisoner chained up in a prison then, um, or threatened with death by a tyrant, I mean, anything, all kinds of terrible things can happen to you, but you can still respond to that by being as virtuous as you can be under the circumstances. And so similarly, the message that the Stoics would give to women is presumably something like, well, accept your social role as a woman, which probably means you're in charge of running the household. But uh, when you do so, make sure that you do everything that you do in a way that's consistent with virtue. So this is almost like the flip side of something Marcus Aurelius says about himself in his meditations, that it's, it's a real drag being the emperor and all that he can do is kind of carry out his duties as the emperor as well as he can, and that that's true for everybody. So just like a peasant or a businessman or whoever it might be has to 
play their role that the cosmos has assigned them in the most virtuous way. So the same thing goes for women. And this might explain that um, the Stoic I mentioned earlier, Musonius Rufus, who actually wrote on this topic about women, says that one reason we want women to be virtuous is so that they can run the household virtuously. So he kind of gives with one hand and takes the, with the other from maybe a modern feminist point of view, and the Stoics do generally. So they say that women can be virtuous just like you, just like men can be, um, but they can't um, necessarily expect the Stoics to come to their rescue and free them from domestic labor, for example. The Stoics just generally think that you should play whatever role has been assigned to you by cosmic fate and by God. Okay, so that's pretty much what we find happening with women in the Hellenistic period. What about the late ancient period? Well, here, um, the first thing to say probably is that there were certainly women philosophers in late antiquity. Uh, so we know, for example, that there were women who were in the circle of those who attended uh, Plotinus's classes in the third century. And in general, it looks like they took to heart Plato's recommendation in the Republic that women can be philosophers. So that's good. Um, maybe a caveat to that is that we, we shouldn't maybe think that this is simply because they've all read the Republic and they thought, oh, I see women can be philosophers. In fact, women should be queens. Um, maybe there should be empresses as well as emperors. We don't find them arguing for that. And in fact, if there aren't that many discussions about the passages in the Republic on women in late antiquity by Platonists, we do have one commentary or really a set of essays about the Republic by a late ancient Platonist named Proclus. And when he gets to the part about women, he actually says that you have to distinguish between what it's, what's being said by Plato in the Republic about women and what Plato says elsewhere especially in a later dialogue called the laws. And in the laws, you have a much less generous discussion of women, which doesn't emphasize that they can be rulers and that they can be philosophers. And so in attempting to kind of solve this disparity between the two texts, Prakla says, well, sure. So in the kind of ideal, perfect society, women would be ruling with men and they would be philosophers. But in real life, it's more like in the laws where they carry out the kind of duties that we expect them to. So this is, I would think, sort of puts under question the idea that the, the presence of women philosophers in the Platonist tradition in late antiquity is directly traceable to the advice given in the Republic. That certainly may have had something to do with it, but I think it's telling that in the one case where we have a late ancient Platonist directly dealing with the Republic, he basically says, yeah, well, that's all correct in theory, but in real life, it's probably not very relevant. I actually have a kind of suspicion or theory about why Platonists may have been especially prone to encourage women to be philosophers. And I can't really back this up with any historical evidence, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because I think it might be true. Um, so certainly the Republic is relevant, but something else that may be relevant is what Platonists think about the soul. And this would also apply to Pythagoreans as well. So what do they think about the soul? Well, they think that the soul is an immaterial substance that can survive the death of the body. Plato argues for this explicitly in a dialogue called the Phaedo. That's the dialogue at the end of which Socrates takes poison and dies. Sorry, spoiler alert. So they think that my soul can leave my body and then survive and go back into another body. And this other body could be a non, the body of a non-human animal. And it could also be a woman's body. Similarly, a woman's soul could leave her body and go into the body of a man. And I guess that if you're the kind of philosopher who thinks of people primarily as disembodied souls that at the moment are in a body, then you'd probably be a lot less likely to think that, the, that people should be kind of rigorously divided into men and women, because really all we've got is souls that as far as I can see, have no gender at all, that then acquire male and female bodies. Whereas if you're more Aristotelian, so you think that the soul is the form of the body and has a very intimate connection with the body, then you might be apt to think that it makes a big difference to your soul 
um, whether you're male or female. And this is something that I think I mentioned when I was talking about Aristotle, that his psychological theory would kind of push him towards thinking of men as being very different from women, um, just by nature, in respect of their rational faculties. So having said that, it's still going to be the case in late antiquity that expectations of women, broadly speaking, are in a sense lower than expectations of men. So it's still kind of just taken for granted by most intellectuals in antiquity that women are more prone to being passionate or more prone to being emotional and so on. And perversely, uh, or maybe ironically, what that means is that women get special credit if they can overcome their passionate urges and their desires. This is something we're going to see again later in the Middle Ages. So the idea here is that since women are kind of tempted by sexual desire, actually it would be one case, but desire in general, um, they tend to kind of lose control of their rationality. When they remain rational and they kind of keep themselves under control, they're especially admirable. And something that's very um, striking here is that the philosophers who we do see in late antiquity, both on the pagan side and on the Christian side, are often praised especially because they were so immune to the kind of call of the body or the domination of desire. And um, this actually goes along with something that maybe I should have mentioned at the outset, which is that in late antiquity and in the Roman period in general, if someone is described as a philosopher, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were a philosopher in our sense. In other words, it doesn't necessarily mean that they wrote treatises about ethics and metaphysics and epistemology. It could actually just mean that they lived, tried to live a virtuous life. So um, sometimes you have, for example, gravestones that say, here lies so-and-so, he or she was a philosopher. And that could just mean he or she was a really good person like he or she really devoted themselves to virtue. And sometimes when you see um, philosophers who are women in late antiquity, both among uh, Christians and among pagans, when they're called philosophers, they're sometimes called that precisely because they were so committed to virtue and the life of the mind. Um, but not always. And here, the paradigm case, and by far the most famous case of a philosopher from late antiquity is of course Hypatia, who was killed by a Latin, uh, by a Christian mob in Alexandria, where she was from. Now, um, Hypatia was a um, mathematician primarily, not a philosopher. And uh, in fact, there's some question here about how, to what extent we can even think of her as a major figure in the history of philosophy, as opposed to being a major figure in the history of mathematics or just intellectual endeavor more generally. Um, now, in some ways, she's a rather unique figure. So for, I mean, for one thing, she was killed by a Christian mob. So that's a quite prominent um, event. And it was actually a very important event in the history of Alexandria. Um, you may know that there's actually even been a movie made about Hypatia, the life of Hypatia called Agora. So you can check that out. Um, it's kind of interesting because it sort of portrays the Christians of the time as religious fanatics with long beards and black robes and everything, sort of as if the Christians of late antiquity were like the Taliban. Um, and on the other side, you have the pagans who in this movie are basically the good guys, and the most important good guy is Hypatia. And in fact, uh, it, to, some extent, to some extent, that's not wrong, at least insofar as um, Hypatia did fall prey to a tension between pagans and Christians. So uh, what was going on at the time was that there was a political dispute between the governor of Alexandria, the Roman governor, whose name was Orestes, and the Christian bishop of Alexandria, who was named Cyril. And Hypatia was particularly closely associated with Orestes, and the Christians thought that she was exerting pernicious influence over her. A mob set out to maybe intimidate her. It's not actually clear what they had in mind. But when they found her, um, she wasn't expecting this to happen. So she wasn't well defended. Um, and they uh, ripped her clothes off, beat her up, and killed her. So obviously a terrible event. Um, and it actually shocked both Christians and pagans in the city and was talked about by later authors. 
Now, as I say, there's a question, so that's a special thing about her. Um, and another special thing about her is that she actually ran a philosophical school, which she inherited from her father, Theon of Alexandria, who like her was a mathematician. So the question here for us is to what extent is she a philosopher? To what extent is she a mathematician? She's certainly a thinker, a woman thinker in, late, in antiquity. So she obviously falls um, under our rubric in this lecture series. And um, here it's not quite clear. So one of the most important sources for Hypatia is by a later Neoplatonist named Damascius, who wrote a biography of another philosopher named Isidore. And in this, he gives a kind of picture of a whole bunch of intellectuals from late antique Platonism. And one of them is Hypatia. And at one point, he comes to compare Hypatia to Isidore, his main character. And he says this, Isidore and Hypatia were very different not only as a man differs from a woman, but as a true philosopher differs from a mathematician. Uh, so it even, I think we should first say what it would mean if she was really like only a mathematician. So um, first of all, that would already be pretty interesting and exciting. So she was clearly a very advanced mathematician. She wrote works on Ptolemy. And in this respect, she can be compared to several other uh, uh, if not philosophers, then mathematicians in antiquity. So, for example, we know about another um, another female mathematician named Pandrosion, who was criticized rather mockingly by a male philosopher named Pappas, who basically condescendingly uh, said that she didn't understand basic maths. Um, so, in that sense, Hypatia would kind of fit into a pattern of late antique female intellectuals who are interested in mathematics. Um, and we might wonder why that is. An obvious partial answer might be that it connects to this long standing tradition of connecting women with Pythagoreanism, because of course the Pythagoreans were really into mathematics. Um, however, there is also some evidence that suggests that Hypatia had philosophical interests as well. And in this respect too, she would not be unique so here we could look to another group of philosophers, not in Alexandria, but in Athens, um, who included a thinker I mentioned before, namely Proclus, the one who commented on Plato's Republic. So it was actually said in a biography of him by his student Marinus that he learned important things about pagan philosophy and ritual from a woman. So let me give you this text. This is from the um, life of Proclus by uh, Marinus. Proclus received these things and learned their significance and application from Asclepigenia, the daughter of Plutarch. For the rites and entire theurgic teaching were preserved by her alone because they were handed down to her by her father. And we actually have some evidence that Hypatia too taught philosophy, just like Asclepigenia apparently did in Athens, and that she was seen as a great sage and uh, kind of honored teacher by a range of her students, some of whom, by the way, were Christians. In particular, there was a Christian student of hers named Synesius, who actually became a bishop. That's how Christian he was. And he was um, trained by her and wrote letters to her, several of which we have. Um, these don't reveal a lot about Hypatia's ideas, unfortunately, but they do, among other things, show us that Hypatia was seen by Synesius before her death as being very powerful and influential because part of what he's doing in these letters is trying to get her to use her political cachet and um, influence to help friends of his. So she was clearly quite a prominent person in Alexandria, um, as you can maybe guess anyway from the fact that this Christian mob deemed her worth killing because she was an ally of this hated Roman governor. So um, overall, I actually tend to think that Hypatia, while clearly a very fascinating figure, is maybe um, inflated beyond what she should be when we think of her as the most important late ancient female philosopher. I think probably the reason for that is the spectacular and tragic death, obviously, um, and, the, and this really interesting contrast between paganism and Christianity, which is so important for the period. So absolutely super fascinating. And I think that it's probably right to say that she was a Platonist philosopher and that she taught Platonist philosophy in her school. But I don't think there's much evidence that we can use to reconstruct her teaching. Uh, and so actually, I think 
that there are more interesting portrayals of other women thinkers around the same period. Um, so again, we're here in the period where paganism is like coexisting with Christianity. And I'm going to talk about two of them now. They're both, and this is, I think, a telling detail, they're both known to us because they were related to famous men. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Monica, who was the mother of St. Augustine. The second person I'm going to talk about is Macrina, who was the sister of Gregory of Nyssa. And uh, these are both very major figures in the history of the church. Augustine is a Latin church father, obviously, so he wrote works in Latin. Um, he was born in North Africa, also lived in Italy, went back to North Africa. Uh, Gregory of Nyssa wrote in Greek and is a major figure in the history of the Byzantine or Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church. Um, and he lived in Cappadocia, which is in modern day Turkey. So like I said before, we don't have works of Monica or Macrina, but we have works by Augustine and Gregory where they tell us about Monica and about Macrina and they say interesting things about them. Things that I think are pretty credible evidence that these people were serious thinkers and also had a lot of influence on Augustine and on Gregory respectively. So let's start with Monica. So Monica um, is a very powerful presence in the works of Augustine and she appears in several of his writings. For one thing, um, especially in Augustine's early writings, several of them take the form of philosophical dialogues. Here we might actually think of Plato as a, an earlier comparison. And sometimes in these dialogues, uh, where Augustine is usually talking to young friends of his who are becoming Christian along with him, Monica will come in as a further interlocutor, and she often is brought in as a kind of raising of the stakes or as an especially wise person whose views are taken very seriously. So it's not quite as if Socrates has shown up, but it's as if maybe an elder or wiser person has turned up, contributes to the conversation, and is in no way kind of minimized for being a woman. That doesn't seem to be on the cards at all in these portrayals of her. But the most vivid portrayal of Monica is in Augustine's work, The Confessions, which in general is one of the most remarkable texts from late antiquity or from antiquity full stop. It's in some ways the first ever spiritual or psychological autobiography. It's Augustine telling the story of how he went from being a non-Christian to being a Christian, and then talking about the continued doubts that he had even after converting to Christianity. So, um, there's a lot one can say about the Confessions and about the role of Monica in it. To make a long story short, Monica plays an important role because from very early on in Augustine's life, she's the one who's always pushing him to convert to Christianity because she's a very pious Christian, very convinced Christian, and she's trying to get him to go away from his wicked ways and become a good Christian himself. So she's almost like his spiritual guide and his spiritual leader. And a lot of the dramatic tension in the, in the uh, Confessions comes from the question of how long it will take Augustine to finally kind of listen to her. And of course, as readers, we're meant to be sympathizing with her and rooting for him to convert to Christianity. Um, the tone of all this is well captured in maybe the most famous line from um, the Confessions, where Augustine is talking about his struggles to become virtuous and to become a good person and a good Christian. And he says that, for a while, his attitude was summed up in a prayer that he gave to God, where he said, oh Lord, make me virtuous, but not yet. So he's still enjoying his sin and wants to kind of sow his wild oats for a while longer before he finally goes on the straight and narrow. So Monica is important throughout the Confessions for this reason, but then there's this climactic scene in the uh, Confessions, in a way the most important scene, where he is in the city of Ostia with her. And this is towards the end of her life. She's gonna die just a couple of pages later in the story. And she and Augustine have these intense conversations about maybe philosophy and religion. And then they have a kind of mystical vision in which Augustine is brought, as it were, face to face with God. So this passage is really worth reading. So here it is. The conversation led us towards the conclusion that the pleasure of the bodily senses, however delightful in the radiant light of this physical world, is seen by comparison with the, light, uh, with the life of eternity to be not even worth considering. Our minds were lifted up by an ardent affection towards eternal being itself. 
Step by step, we climbed beyond all corporeal objects and the heaven itself. We ascended even further by internal reflection and dialogue and wonder at your words, and we entered into our own minds. We moved beyond them so as to attain to the region of inexhaustible abundance. There, life is the wisdom by which all creatures come into being, both things which were and which will be. But wisdom itself is not brought into being, but is as it was and always will be. In this wisdom, there is no past and future, but only being, since it is eternal. So here um, we can see Augustine actually referring to a lot of ideas that are very Platonist. And this makes sense because something else that he says in the Confessions is that he was brought over to Christianity in large part by studying Platonism. So in a way, we can see Monica kind of being brought in here as a spiritual guide who, together with themes from the Platonic tradition to this idea of a divine cause who is beyond all corporeal things and even beyond time, right? So there's no past, present, or future for God. There's just this kind of eternal now. He's just this unchanging, perfect divinity. And in this vision that Augustine and Monica share together, they are granted a chance to behold this divinity. And this is kind of the ultimate moment that shocks Augustine out of his wicked ways. And he tries to leave sin behind and become a good Christian. And as I said, just a few pages later, we actually have Monica's death scene. And it's really underscored how much her role in the story is to be his guide to Christianity. So this is the, this is the passage with her um, final words. She says to him, my son, I now find no pleasure in this life. What I have still to do here and why I am here, I do not know. My hope in this world is already fulfilled. The one reason why I wanted to stay longer in this life was my desire to see you a Catholic Christian before I die. My God has granted this in a way more than I had hoped, for I see you despising this world's success to become his servant." So, fitting last words from Monica there. And um, you can see that Augustine takes her seriously, both as a kind of ethical paradigm, but also as, to some extent, I would say a philosophical figure. So she's taken seriously intellectually as well as spiritually. And as I say, there's really never any trace, as far as I can tell, in Augustine of Monica being sort of demoted from the level of something like a religious sage um, on the basis of her gender. I think if you wanted to say that there's anything kind of sexist or unsatisfying about the portrayal of Monica, it might be that her role in the story is really always subsidiary to the story about Augustine's own spiritual career. So we never see her develop. We never see her facing doubt. All the, the profound psychology of the confession is always in Augustine's psychology is not in Monica. So she's kind of a minor character, but she's a very important minor character and one who's treated with a lot of respect. I think we should all hope to be treated so well by our children in their autobiographies, in fact. Um, so speaking of someone treating one of their family members with a lot of respect, let's now turn to Macrina, who, as I said, is the sister of Gregory of Nyssa, one of the most important Greek uh, fathers and sources of Byzantine theology and philosophy. So actually, you may never have heard of him. He's not exactly a household name, but he's one of the few early Greek Christian writers who then are really um, very influential for the whole later uh, Orthodox tradition. Um, actually, there are three Cappadocian fathers, um, Basil and then two Gregories, Gregory Nazantius and Gregory of Nyssa. So we're talking here about Gregory of Nyssa, so don't confuse him with the other Gregory. And this Gregory wrote two works dealing with his sister, Macrina, who actually I would say we should almost treat as a fourth grade Cappadocian. So she's someone who, again, we don't know necessarily a lot about directly because we only find out about her through the works of Gregory. But he writes about her in a way that suggests that, if anything, she's the superior intellect and superior, superior spiritual figure. So he looks up to her as a teacher um, and uh, treats her with a lot of respect. So there's two works here. Um, one I'll just mention briefly. There's a work called The Life of Macrina, which is basically a hagiography of her. So in other words, a saint's life written by Gregory. And you might think, well, gosh, why am I not talking all about that? That sounds really exciting. There must be loads of her ideas in there. And the reason I'm not is that although it's an interesting text, 
he doesn't really present her in any way as a philosopher. In fact, it focuses mostly on her achievements as a kind of spiritual heroine and her ability to work miracles and things like that. So it's more like a story about um, late ancient Christian ascetic uh, spiritual virtue. And if all we had was that, it would really just fit into a broader pattern of treatment of women in late ancient Christian literature. So just generally in late ancient Christian literature, there are quite a lot of works that praise these spiritual heroes, like for example, Anthony the Great, some of whom went off into the desert or lived at the top of a column like Simeon the Stylite, um, so, or lived in a cave or went without eating for weeks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the movement that's sometimes called Christian asceticism. And some of the ascetics in question were women and were written about. And this work about Macrina kind of fits into that model. So it's a biography of her as a virtuous saint, really, um, who does things like miraculously recovering from illnesses. To my mind, though, the more interesting work featuring Macrina is a work called On Soul and Intellect. And this is really fascinating. It's a dialogue, another dialogue, between Gregory himself and Macrina. So the setup is that um, Gregory's brother has just died, and he goes to be comforted by his sister, Macrina, but he finds that she is also dying. She's on her deathbed. And so he's very distraught. And they then have a conversation about whether or not the soul is immortal. So um, you may already have noticed this, but that sounds a lot like another dialogue, one I actually mentioned just a few minutes ago in passing, Plato's Phaedo. So there we have a dialogue featuring someone who's about to die, uh, who's arguing about whether or not the soul is immortal. And then at the end, um, this person dies. So of course, I'm thinking of Plato's Phaedo and the portrayal of Socrates' final moments. So obviously, this is not a coincidence. What Gregory is doing here is he's kind of retelling the Phaedo, so, the, so Plato's dialogue about the immortality of the soul, in which we're shown Socrates dying and him spending his last moments debating the immortality of the soul. And he's rewriting this from a Christian perspective, but fascinatingly enough, putting his sister in the role of Socrates. So um, there are several points that we can take from this. Uh, maybe I should say just at the outset that we should bear in mind again that we're reading Gregory's words here and not Macrina's words. And we really have no way of knowing to what extent Gregory is putting words in her mouth. Probably the only way we could tell that at all is to look at what Gregory says about the soul in other works and see whether it's almost exactly the same. But even then, I think we could probably assume that Macrina and Gregory would agree quite a lot about the nature of the soul. And maybe we could even suppose that Macrina influenced Gregory's thinking of this on the soul. So I think we should, in a way, probably be agnostic about how much of the content here is Gregory and how much of the content is Macrina. So again, this is in a way sort of a diatema problem. Like, right? so you have a woman who's being used as a spokesperson for by a man, and you don't know whether it's the man's ideas or the woman's ideas. Um, but one thing we can definitely say about Macrina in this dialogue is that she's presented in a highly kind of rationalist way. So in a way that kind of um, undercuts people's expectations about women. So I'll read you now the beginning or a passage from the beginning of the dialogue. Um, so this is just after she's come in and seen how sick she is. And uh, he says, the sight of the teacher awakened all my pain for she was lying in a state of prostration even unto death. She gave him to me for a little while like a skillful driver in the ungovernable violence of my grief. And then she tried to check me by speaking and to correct with the curve of her reasonings, the disorder of my soul. So one thing we notice here is that the portrayal of her, actually, again, it sounds a lot like Socrates. So one thing that happens in the Phaedo is that Socrates' family, his wife, and then later his friends are pictured as being sort of emotionally hysterical. And he gets rid of the wife and says, go, you know, leave me alone to talk with my friends in peace. And when, then when his friends break down crying because he's about to be executed, he says, stop acting like women. Here we have a woman telling Gregory to pull himself together and be 
more under control. She's the rational one. She's, from an ancient point of view, the one who's acting like a man. And in fact, um, that's something we often find ancient Christians saying about these ascetic, heroic women, that they were so amazing. It was almost like they were men. This is uh, something that we probably find appalling nowadays, but in antiquity and in the Middle Ages, often counted as a kind of compliment that would be given to women. Um, but it's not just that. It's not just that she is so rational and so calm in her dying moments. It's also that that attitude fits perfectly with the theory of soul that she then goes on to explain. So what she targets in the conversation, and it's really, by the way, her doing all of the heavy lifting. So she has all the ideas. Gregory only asks questions, occasionally gives objections or asks follow-up questions, but she's the teacher throughout. She's got a theory of soul, which she's sharing with Gregory, and she's in no doubt about it. So she's not at all hesitant about this theory. And what she's targeting is theories of soul according to which the soul will be dispersed upon death. And in particular, what she doesn't like is the theory of a Hellenistic school that I mentioned way back at the beginning of this lecture, namely the Epicureans. They were atomists and they thought that when I die, for example, my soul, which is just made of a bunch of atoms, will disperse and I'll no longer exist. And she says that this cannot possibly be true, that there must be a separate immaterial psychological principle in the body, so obviously the soul, which holds it together and will survive the death of the body. And the whole dialogue is her argument for that. Um, one of the central ways that she tries to prove this is by drawing a parallel between the human on the one hand and the entire cosmos on the other hand, because she wants to say, just as the cosmos is a physical object, that has a spiritual governor, namely God. So our body is a physical object that has a spiritual governor, namely the soul. So let me read you a passage about this. It has been said by wise men that the human is a microcosm and contains all the elements that go to complete the universe. Our conception of the soul is that it exists with a special nature of its own, independently of the body. It is in essence created and living, intellectual, transmitting from itself to an organized and sentient body, the power of living and of grasping objects of sensation. So I would say what she's doing here basically is, is accepting, broadly speaking, a Platonist theory of soul and using it to refute another pagan theory of soul, namely that of the Epicureans. On the other hand, obviously what she's saying fits very well with Christian theology. So she's saying, well, the soul relates to the body the way that God relates to the world. And this is one of her central arguments for why the soul can survive the death of the body, just as God doesn't depend for his existence on the existence of the world, so the soul doesn't depend for its existence on the existence of the body. So she's drawing a lot on pagan ideas. On the other hand, she does make sure to say that she only relies on pagan ideas insofar as they can help. Um, so even though her approach is not, as it were, like biblical, she doesn't keep quoting the Bible at Gregory as if that were enough, and she doesn't come off as a Christian theologian, she comes off more as a Christian philosopher, I would say. Nonetheless, she distances herself from pagan philosophers like Plato, and sometimes criticizes pagan philosophical views, including something I mentioned earlier, the theory of, um, of reincarnation. So she complains that um, the pagans believe that souls can sort of go from one body to another, and she thinks that that doesn't happen. However, she does spend a lot of time at the end of the dialogue arguing for the possibility of bodily resurrection, which of course is a more Christian theme. So um, the idea here is no reincarnation, so no cycle of births, such as you might get in Buddhism, um, but yes to the idea of a body being resurrected at the end of time for our soul to rejoin. So um, in that respect, she's a lot like a lot of other Christian thinkers who are kind of torn in the sense that on the one hand, they think that our true self is the soul. On the other hand, they think that the soul really belongs with a body and that we should get a body back at the end of time. So um, this work called On Body and Resurrection, or sorry, On the Soul and Resurrection, um, it's a very interesting philosophical work. It's a very interesting portrayal of a woman thinker in late antiquity. And actually, in my opinion, at least from what I've read, it's the most interesting work involving a woman from late antiquity. It's the most kind of philosophically 
uh, rich text where we have a woman thinker being presented to us on her own terms and being allowed to present her own arguments for a uh, matter of great importance to her given that she's about to die. So I highly recommend reading it. Um, that's going to wrap up our story about women thinkers in late antiquity. Next time, we're going to be looking at something that, as it happens, I've just mentioned, which is the Indian tradition, where, again, we find reincarnation uh, in the Buddhist tradition, but also in um, the Vedic or Hindu traditions. And we're going to be looking at pretty early texts from the Upanishads and other works, including the Mahabharata, which portray women philosophers in ancient India. So we're going to be moving cultures, but not moving very far in time. Uh, and that's going to be in the next lecture. Thanks very much for listening.